in elk verhaal tot hiertoe terugkwam, is dat enerzijds dat het geluk, dat er veel te veel aandacht besteed wordt uh, aan het geluk, want geluk op zich is geen doel op zichzelf. En ten tweede, dat die dwang tot geluk leidt tot de moralisering uh, van geluk. In tegenstelling tot de najaarsreeks, die meer algemeen beschouwend was, gaan we in deze voorjaarsreeks meer specifiek in op vragen als wat doen mensen zoal om gelukkig te worden om, of om het geluk in hun leven te bevorderen. Zo bijvoorbeeld zullen sprekers als Luc de Leu volgende keer en Menno van der Veen de keer erop zich toespitsen op vragen als wat is de invloed van kunst, architectuur en van sociale media, Luc van de, Ve uh, van de Veen dan, op ons geluksgevoel. Michael de Kok die zal uh, spreken over mensen die alles achterlaten op zoek naar het geluk, ook wel, uh, oftewel migrantenstromers, migrantenstromen van gelukszoekers genoemd. En in de laatste bijeenkomst tenslotte wordt die maakbaarheid van geluk ter discussie gesteld in een tweespraak tussen enerzijds professor Ruud Veenhoven, de man van de gelukswetenschappen, en de econoom-filosoof uh, professor Toon van der Velde, die daar zeer kritisch tegenover staat. En vandaag uh, belichten we eigenlijk een bijzondere vorm van geluk zoeken. We, gaan, we staan met name stil bij die mensen voor wie het geluk niet zo vanzelfsprekend is en die toevlucht nemen tot onder andere antidepressiva of antipsychotica. Ziektes zoals depressie of bipolaire stoornissen, beter gekend als manisch depressiviteit, hebben de laatste jaren een hoge vlucht genomen, ondanks of dankzij of <coughs> parallel aan de geluksmanie. En de farmaceutische industrie die speelt daar zeer, zeer graag op in. De rol van die farma-industrie bij het promoten van, geluks, van de gelukspillenconsumptie, dat is het onderwerp van vandaag. Na de lezing volgt er een korte nabespreking door David van Wunder, lector uh, psychologie van onze eigenste hogeschool, uh, aan de faculteit Mens en Welzijn. David is niet alleen een kenner en fan van het werk van David Haley, maar hij heeft zelf ook enkele jaren in de psychiatrie gewerkt en stage gelopen in Laborde. Laborde dat is een bijzondere, een bijzondere psychiatrie in de Loire-Vallei in Frankrijk, die werkt volgens de inzichten van de institutionele psychotherapie. En nu I'm switching to English because uh, the speaker of tonight is the English psychiatrist David Haley. Professor, David, uh, Professor Haley, a warm welcome to you. It's a great honor to have you here because, according to us, you are the expert by excellence to talk about the dangers of our never-ending pursuit of happiness. And I'm convinced about that, not only because of your publications such as the antidepressant era or the creation of psychopharmacology or letter in Prozac, but also because of your excellent work in the history of psychiatry. And um, Last but not least, and let me express it quite mildly, uh, your not always non-controversial views on the influence of the pharma industry, pharmaceutical industry on medicine and academia. Professor Healy, we are very curious about your ideas that you are going to elaborate in your talk entitled The Money in Mania. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sophie. Let's begin here. Let's begin in the 19th century. There's an illness you've probably all heard of called manic depressive illness. The word mania and the word melancholia go back to the Greeks, but manic depressive illness was first described in France during the 19th century. It's an extraordinarily severe illness that causes people to commit suicide. It ruins their careers, ruins their marriages, ruins their lives. It's one of those illnesses that we really do need treatments for. And until very recently, this is an extraordinarily <coughs> rare illness. No one in this room was at any real risk of having manic depressive illness or even of knowing anyone who had it. The problem for you all now is that it's an, an, an epidemic. And what we're going to discuss is how an illness that was awfully rare could become one that's awfully common and that has, has, has implications for all of you. Back in 
1995-96 or so, the SSRI group of drugs like Prozac, Zoloft, drugs that you've all, I'm sure, heard of, drugs that, that um, quite a few people here in the audience are at risk of being on, are knowing people who are related to you who are on this illness. These drugs were coming off patent. The pharmaceutical companies didn't have a new generation of antidepressant drugs to replace the drugs that were aging and at risk of not making them any more money. So the solution to the problem was to change things around so the people who were previously seen as being depressed would now be seen as being bipolar instead. And rather than be given an older drug from which uh, the pharmaceutical company didn't make much money, like an antidepressant, you were going to be given a newer drug like a mood stabilizer from which industry could make a huge amount of money. And the first of the mood stabilizers was this. This was a drug called Depakote, which was launched in 1996. You know that <coughs> drug companies don't just, I mean, they don't use the actual name of the drug. They create a brand name for the drug also. And all of the marketing of the drug goes on the brand name. So you see the brand name of the drug there, Depakote. But there's an even better and more important piece of branding in this advert, and it's here on the next slide, and it's the word mood stabilizer. That conjures up to you the idea that if you're on these pills, your moods, which may have been going up and down, will even out. The trouble is, in medicine, to have an evening out like this means that the drug should be prophylactic. But if the company had said that this drug was prophylactic, they would have been sued. They would have been breaking the law because they had no evidence that their drug evens your mood out. The word mood stabilizer um, suggests this is what will, um, will actually happen. Articles that appear in uh, the scientific literature with the word mood stabilizer in their, their title. And you can see just before this drug's launched, the first articles appear using this term, and afterwards we get up to a hundred articles per year now have this term in, uh, in uh, the title. All of a sudden, books on uh, the psychiatric drugs, which didn't have chapters on mood stabilizers before, all have a chapter on the mood stabilizers. And there's two drugs in the group. One is the drugs that have been used to treat people who have epilepsy, the anticonvulsants, and the other drugs are the antipsychotics, drugs which previously have only been used to treat patients who've got schizophrenia. These are now being marketed also as mood stabilizers. What you now hear, what you don't hear about now, what you don't find now is any books on manic depressive illness. This illness that's been around for a long time that we know a lot about, you don't find any books about it, you don't find articles about it, you see references to bipolar disorder. Bipolar uh, disorder is a term that's coined in 1980, but you still, from 1980 onwards, you don't find hardly any articles on it until 1995 when Abbott are about to launch semi-sodium valproate for bipolar disorder. What industry are doing here is branding a whole new group of drugs but also branding a new illness that we didn't have before. And bipolar disorder as you're just about to see is an extraordinarily different illness to manic depressive illness. All of a sudden you have journals created for this new illness. They weren't there before. You have meetings created worldwide. You have academic 
associations which meet in Asia and Australia and North America and Europe. And they're the same group of speakers, profs of psychiatry from Belgium or France or Holland or Germany or the United States or, or, or Japan. They're on the bipolar disorder circuit. <clears throat> when doctors are going to prescribe a drug, these days they go by the scientific evidence. The controlled trials that are out there that show that the drug works are not. And you see these articles appearing in some of the best journals in the field, like the New England Journal of Medicine or the BMJ or whatever, and you see the authorship line of uh, the journals with very big names in the field on it. What you find is these articles in all the best journals with the biggest names in the field on it, they aren't written by these people. They are ghost-written within pharmaceutical companies. Somewhere between 80 and 100 percent of the academic literature in medicine on drugs that are on patent is ghost-written. And that's important for all of you. And the, I mean, it isn't just mental health drugs, it's heart drugs or respiratory drugs. If you're on any drug at all, or your parents or anyone you know is on any drug at all, the chances are the evidence that dictates what they're being treated with is written by ghost authors and these articles hide the benefits of the drugs and hide the risks. Now here's probably the important drug um, uh, to focus in on <clears throat> for this purpose. This is a drug that was launched in 1996 and from Early on, you see the company is claiming as well that it's going to be a mood stabilizer. This is one of the antipsychotics that was previously used to treat people who have schizophrenia. But it's now being moved over to be used to treat people who are bipolar. It's a drug called Zyprexa. The company has helped create patient groups. They've written literature for the patients who have this illness. And as you see, where manic depressive illness, or as you begin to see here, where manic depressive illness was a very severe illness before, where people ended up in, uh, in, in hospital, now bipolar disorder is much more a lifestyle option. You see this person out on their bike, trying to keep fit and healthy. If you have this illness, you will have it for life. And the one thing that you must do if you have the illness is you must keep taking the medication. If you don't take the medication, the illness will get worse, the episodes will become more frequent, you'll have bigger and bigger problems. And here on the inside, um, <clears throat> you see the key messages that patients are being told. This is an illness that you'll have for all your life, and the symptoms may Come and go. You may feel well, but even if you do feel well, the illness will still be there. People feel better when their medicines are working. The more episodes, that's the more you halt your pills and get ill again, the harder and harder it becomes to treat the illness. Well, none of this is true. What they aren't saying to patients is, that every study done on the life expectancy of people put on these two drugs and other drugs in the group show a doubling of mortality rates. You have a reduction of life expectancy of something like 10 to 20 years, depending on the study you look at. What these drugs do, generally both the anticonvulsants and the antipsychotics do, is to double the risk that you're going to go on to try to kill yourself and in fact that you will succeed. Even though you're being put on the drug in order to cure the illness that would lead you to commit suicide. These drugs are among the riskiest drugs to give to women of childbearing years. They have a very high risk of causing the child to be born with birth defects.
Don't worry about it. You want to be bipolar. You didn't want to be manic depressive. Every artist in history, from Van Gogh to Schumann, all the poets, the artists, the musicians, everybody has had bipolar disorder. You too want this illness. One of the key tools is to get by on the part of the company. They're not just trying to sell an illness to you, they're trying to sell measurements to you. Because if they get you to measure things and appear to be scientific, the measurements will create a problem that the pill is the answer to. In this case, you're being asked to keep a mood diary. Here's just, just to give you a feel for what, what plus two looks like and what <coughs> minus two looks like. If you track your moods each day like this, it's a bit like getting up on the weighing scales and tracking your weight. You're going to find yourself a little bit heavier than you wished you were, and this is going to cause a problem. If you have a good day during the week, and if you also have a bad day like Monday, you're bipolar. And, but the key thing here is almost regardless of what answers you give to the question, you're being told, take the checklist to your doctor. And once you take it to your doctor, you give her or him a problem also, for which the company's pill is the answer. And if you want to understand what's going here on here, think of weighing scales. <clears throat> we began to <coughs> weigh ourselves first in the 1870s. Shortly afterwards, through the first descriptions of a new illness, eating disorders, anorexia nervosa. Once the rain scales changed from the one you see here to be the kinds that could be found in every drugstore, pharmacy, uh, I'm unsure how things were here, but when I was young in Ireland, you had every pharmacy that you went to had a weighing scale in it, you put a coin in it and get your weight. And there was a plate on it which told you what the right weight for your height was. All of a sudden, it creates a problem. As measurement technologies migrated into our lives, they created the eating disorders. They only created them in the West. Women in particular in the West were at risk of eating disorders where women elsewhere in the world didn't get eating disorders. We wondered about you know, the social factors, we wondered about child abuse, we wondered about the role of women, all kinds of things, but no one looked at a simple thing like the weighing scales as a cause of the problem. This, is, uh, this was a few years ago Ireland's top model. <clears throat> you see her, she's awfully attractive. <clears throat> this is how she's at risk of looking later on in life. Why? Well, because she's going to get osteoporosis, this terrible illness, and it's going to do this to her. When I trained in medicine first in the early 80s, no one had osteoporosis. It was a, an extraordinarily rare illness. Now, one third of women over the age of 50 have osteoporosis. And they're all being told that they're going to end up like this. And they get the illness not because their bones break, they get the illness because the companies that make drugs which could be used for this condition market measurement uh, machines to clinics and doctors. Because they know if the doctors use the machine to scan people's bones, they will create the illness. The best answer to bits of bones that are thin are to get fit, to go out and exercise. They aren't to take a pill. Medicine, when it works right, when it cures tuberculosis, when it cures serious illnesses like diabetes, liberates us from fear. But what you have here is a marketing of fear. In the case of bipolar disorder, or in the case of depression, what you're told is if you do not treat the illness, if you're a 
parent, you're told, if you don't treat the illness in your child as early as possible, that child's going to go on to suicide and divorce and alcoholism and drug abuse and their careers going to fail. They produced material like this about a woman called Donna, who comes along to her doctor and says she feel, feels anxious and irritable. And here's the clinical picture that I'll let you read through. During the 1960s, Donna would, be, would have been viewed as being anxious and she would have been treated with a benzodiazepine drug. During the 1990s, she would, the same person would have been, was her, her doctor was trained to diagnose her as being depressed and she would be given a drug like Prozac, a much more dangerous <coughs> drug than any of the benzodiazepines. And during recent years, the doctors have been trained to diagnose Donna as having bipolar, bipolar um, disorder, and she's going to be given a drug that's much more dangerous than either Valium or Prozac. This is post-modernism. There's no scientific changes here that warrant the change of diagnosis. <coughs> Donna is like a piece of text that can be read one way today and a different way the next day and a different way the day after. And all of that comes together in this, which hopefully... Your doctor probably never sees you when you feel like this. This is usually who your doctor sees. That deeply depressed you who barely dragged yourself in for treatment. That's why so many people with bipolar disorder are being treated for depression and not getting any better. Because depression is only half the story. That fast-talking, energetic, quick-tempered, overdoing it up all night you probably never shows up in the doctor's office. Right? Log on to BipolarAwareness.com, sponsored by Lilly, on WebMD, the place for healthcare answers. Take the test you can take to your doctor. It can change your life. Let your doctor in on it. In order to make a correct diagnosis, your doctor has to know about your ups as well as your downs. Getting a correct diagnosis is the first step in treating bipolar disorder. Help your doctor help you. What you saw there was all the tricks that I outlined earlier. Making the illness look awfully attractive, creating rating scales that the patient fills that gives her a problem and gives the doctor a problem, creating an awareness of an illness that didn't exist before. Manic depressive patients didn't look like this. There's not a mention of the pill, but this is wonderful marketing for a pill. Manic depressive illness until 10 or 15 years ago, until 10 years ago, the consensus view for over a century was shaped by a man called Theodore Zehan. Before Theodore Zehan, people had said the view for 800 years before that was manic depressive illness did not start before the age of 20. Zehan changed those views and said that people who are teenagers can get this illness. It's very rare, but 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds and 15-year-olds very, very occasionally can have this illness. If you look carefully, you'll find that a few of the people where you thought the illness began later actually showed signs earlier. And that was the view for a hundred years, the worldwide view. But that's changed. This is a book that came out in the year 2000 in the States called The Bipolar Child. <clears throat> it's about, as you see on the book, about childhood's most misunderstood disorder. Books, as you see, for children. Books to train children how to be bipolar. There's my bipolar roller coaster feeling.
book. And this is going to teach you, this is going to give you the cardinal features of what bipolar disorder looks like in children. Remember, if they get the diagnosis, the children are going to be put on drugs like Zyprexa and Risperdal. Zyprexa has the highest suicide rate in clinical trial history. Zyprexa causes huge weight gain and diabetes. All of these drugs cause neurological problems. So on the inside you see what the text says that <clears throat> I'm bipolar because there's three things I do as a kid. There are times when I'm very enthusiastic. I'm really cheerful and I let people know about it. I go around and I hug them and I laugh and you know, that's one of the features of bipolar disorder in children. The second feature is this. I go out to the supermarket with my mother and I might ask her for chocolates or whatever and if she says no you can't have them I have a temper and I throw things. So there's two of the features. There are times when I'm silly and cheerful. There are times when I have a temper. What's the third feature to make the diagnosis in children? Well the third feature is I have nightmares. I go to bed at times and I wake up screaming with a nightmare. If you have those three features in your child, you're bipolar. You guys didn't know this, but you are. Here is a mood diary specially designed for children. If anything could train a child to be bipolar, this is it. And doesn't this doctor look nice and reassuring? Isn't this exactly the kind of doctor you'd all <laughs> like to meet? Well, let's see what the doctor says to Brandon. <clears throat> he says, Brandon, you've got bipolar disorder. By what, says Brandon? Bipolar disorder, repeats Dr. Samuel. You see, the way we feel is controlled by chemicals in our brain. In people with bipolar disorder, these chemicals can't do their job right, so the feelings get jumbled up inside. If you've ever had jumbled feelings, well, it's because your, your chemicals are jumbled. You might feel wonderfully happy one minute and horribly angry the next, very excited, terribly sad, extremely irritated, all in the one day. That's bipolar disorder. How did I get this illness? Well, we know that the reason he got this illness is he got it from the marketing department of the pharmaceutical company. But that's not what Brandon's told. Brandon is told, well how, Brandon, did you get your green eyes and your brown hair? Well, I got my green eyes from my mother and my brown hair from my father. Well, that's how you got your bipolar disorder too. It's in our genes. But there's good news. We've got wonderful medicines to help you. As I've said, these drugs reduce your life expectancy when you begin them in your 20s and 30s. They reduce your life expectancy by 10 to 20 years. If you begin children on them at the age of 4 and 5, we don't know how much they're going to reduce the life expectancy. This is like treating a cold with cancer chemotherapy. The kind of drugs you would use to treat a tumour. It's like giving drugs like that to a child who has a cold. They are used, were used in the Soviet Union for torture purposes. You can get people to confess if you give these drugs and induce the kind of feelings that can be induced if they're the wrong drug for you. In the United States they can make the diagnosis of bipolar disorder, it seems, in utero. Okay, that's from the, in, that's text straight from the bipolar child. Parents who remember that my child kicked a lot and moved a lot in the womb. This was clearly 
the first evidence that this child had bipolar disorder. This book was written by academic, uh, academic uh, psychiatrists. It's not written by anyone. I mean, these are people who hold university positions. During the 1950s, they did have, I mean, not on their own, but between universities and industry, we did discover new treatments that released us from scourges that had plagued us and killed our children early for millennia. All of a sudden, human life became a lot freer, a lot better. In response, we locked the pharmaceutical industry up in prescription-only prescribing of these drugs. They were forced to put their drugs through controlled trials. They were told, you cannot put these drugs on the market openly, they can be for diseases only. We didn't realize that if the industry could only sell their drugs for diseases only, that the obvious answer was to make everyone diseased. Even an overactive child in the womb is diseased. The story of manic depressive illness begins with Philippe Pinel in France. And Pinel was the first person to take the treatment of the mentally ill out of the hands of the church and other groups like that. But he was also a person who said that mental illness and all health is the duty of the state. It cannot be left to the marketplace. He said this because one of the things he said, in essence, was that the market does not understand the word no. But the, it's a great clinical skill to be able to give a drug that cures an illness. It's an even greater skill to know when not to give a drug. What medicine has become in recent years is a place where the industry control all of the evidence. This gets, gets written into guidelines which say what we should do for illnesses from hypertension to asthma to diabetes to bipolar disorder. And all of these guidelines say you should use drugs A and B and C and D. And if they don't work, you use combinations of A and B and C and D. You don't ever not give a treatment. Increasingly, doctors who do not give a pill are at risk of being sacked. This is a book that's just come out, or will be out in the next few weeks, which is about just this. It's the crisis in healthcare that faces all of us. I've given you a talk about one illness. I've given you a talk about manic depressive illness and what's happened there. But exactly the same thing is happening for cardiac illnesses and respiratory illnesses and all other illnesses. This is an issue that's one of the most important issues of our day for all of us. It's an issue about where the market, what role the market should have in all of these. It's a highly political issue. It's an issue where the politics becomes personal. Uh, I have a blog about these things which I've just begun a few weeks ago also, which is there. And in a few weeks' time we're going to be opening up a website where people who are on treatments and having a problem on the treatment can report the problems to the website, because as things stand at the moment, your doctor, if you have a problem on any treatment you're on, is not going to be listening to you and is not going to report the problem to anyone. Thank you. So, uh, evidence-based practice, which is very much uh, en vogue today, do you think it's a scientific method or a marketing method? <clears throat> in, in um, what you need to realize is that the people who most vigorously advocate evidence-based medicine are the pharmaceutical companies because they're using the English 
meaning of the word, which is, it is proven. We've done controlled trials, but you can't see the data of the trials. We've done these trials, and this is what the trials show. They do not want you to practice evidence-based medicine in the sense of either a doctor or a patient going by what is self-evidently the evidence of their own eyes and their own experience. Industry do not want that kind of evidence-based medicine. You've talked a lot about uh, the industry, um, and I was wondering, um, to place things in a, in, in a bigger picture, um, would this be possible in, in a society which is not uh, guided by uh, the neoliberal neoliberal uh, economy? You know, in the society, everything must be sold, everything, and then needs are created. We don't need things, but but they need to sell uh, objects, cars, or iPads or iPhones. We don't need them, and so they create the needs. Yeah, no. Well, it's a little different to iPads and cars and things like that. <clears throat> the market in healthcare is different to any other market there is. Industry don't market to you. They don't. Um, I am the person they market to. I am the consumer. And I consume by putting the pill in your mouth. And I have no side effects from the pill being put in your mouth. It's very different to the pilot on a plane. A pilot on a plane takes the same flight as all of you. So if the plane goes down, she gets killed as well. So pilots report the problems on a plane flight when there's a near miss or any accident. Doctors don't report the near misses that happen to you or any of the accidents or any of the injuries because they're not on the flight they put you on. If one of the interesting things that happened, and it isn't a slide that I can show you, here is in the last 40 years, because drugs have been available on prescription only, cars used to be things that didn't have seat belts. They didn't have airbags. They now have seat belts and airbags and they have a symbol and if you don't fasten the seat belt before you start the car, the car won't start. Or at least there'll be a beep, 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 trying to say to you, you have to fasten the seat belt. Cars have become safer and safer. Pills, 50 years ago, used to have a poison symbol on them. That has been removed. Industry say this is prejudicial. We do not want any of you regarding these drugs as a poison. The, you know, the, all of the efforts to make, it, to make you aware that there could be risks have been removed. It's even at the point where there are proposals now that antidepressant drugs should come stamped with a symbol on them of a pregnant woman in order to reassure women that they can take these drugs during pregnancy. Antidepressants are now the most commonly prescribed drugs in pregnancy. Up to 15% of pregnant women are on them even though the evidence is they double the rate of birth defects, double the rate of miscarriages, and double the rate of children being born to women who have been pregnant on these drugs, having a mental handicap. This is a system we put in place following a crisis with a drug called thalidomide in 1962. But the system we put in place is one that is now causing the problems that we now have. It's wrong, I mean, it would be wrong if you take my talk as anti-drugs, I use drugs. It would be wrong if you take my talk as anti-industry. It's, it's about a system we've put in place that is causing us all problems. And if there's any group of people who've failed you the most, it's not industry, it's your doctors who haven't been, I mean, these drugs were made available on prescription only, so your doctors were the people who would let you know what the risks were. 
that they are the one people that industry can now depend on not to let you know what the risks are. That was a long answer. Sorry. No problem. But if I get you right, it's not only the doctors who are the problem because uh, you've talked about uh, university professors who participates in, 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 in uh, a scam, actually. And so I was wondering, it's dangerous because they teach. They uh, show to, to, to young people how they have to uh, practice. But I was wondering, um, the fact that um, they are compliant to that, that they do that sort of thing, that they um, are prepared to uh, put their name on an article that they uh, never wrote. Can it be linked with the way in which um, academia functions today? That is to say, uh, professors are uh, judged on the basis of their scientific output. That is to say, the number of publications in uh, highly rated journals. So again, that I think it's a problem of, of economics, of our, the way our society is uh, organized today. Yeah, no, um, I think, uh, I think yes, you're, uh, that you're, um, you're, you're right. Um, that's part of the reason why we're trying to create a uh, website here. At the moment, industry have all the data. They run the trials, they have all the data, and it proves very easy to recruit academics to have their names put on articles. The only way around this, but I mean, one of the, let me try and give, let me slightly scare you. Um, I, one of the things I've tried to do is to talk about the hazards and risks of drugs like Prozac. And some years ago at a, at um, one of the talks I gave, uh, the PR person who was uh, responsible for Prozac in the UK came up to me and said, oh, you're David Healy. I am so pleased to meet you. You are doing more for the sales of Prozac in the UK than anyone else. <laughs> Giving a lecture like this by a person like me isn't the way to solve the problem. Critics do not solve the problem. The way we're going to solve the problem is to generate other data that everybody has access to. And that's why we're hoping to create a website where people who go on drugs report what actually happens to them on the drug to create data that academics, there's a lot of academics out there who don't put their name to articles that are written by industry. But they don't have data to talk about. And in this world, you can't just be a professor who gives a view. You've got to have data. So what we need to, what all of us in this room need to do and elsewhere is to create the data that industry is currently hiding. And the last question before uh, I give the audience. Uh, you mentioned uh, patient groups and in my experience uh, it's very difficult to convince people who are uh, who either had a diagnosis or who know someone in their uh, family who had a diagnosis. It's very difficult to be critical about a diagnosis because you, most of the time you get very violent reactions. My son is sick, my husband is really sick, he can't help it, it's his brain that doesn't function. What do you think is, is, is the position of, of, of patient groups? Because we know a lot of them are highly sponsored by uh, the industry. And it made me also think of a quote by uh, Stephen Rose, who once said that every society has the science it deserves. So, on, on, on a certain level, the system only functions because people are, are, are prepared to, uh, to cooperate with that. In one way or another, people are, are relieved when they are not feeling too good and suddenly they get a diagnosis and it's a relief. And then they go and group in, in patient groups, which, which are really some form of, of lobby groups. What is your opinion on that? 
Well, um, we could be here for the next hour if you really wanted me to answer that question. I agree with all of that, yes. Uh, I think that's um, the kind of problem that we have. But as I say, I could give you an awfully long answer. I think it's easier maybe if we throw it over to the floor and give, give the audience uh, the opportunity to ask maybe slightly different questions. And if there's a bit of time left over, then we can go back to that one. Good. The word is on the side. I just wonder, in this internet world, how is it possible that the industry can get away with hiding the data? I always wonder, I always agreed with you, but I have this enormous discussion with this group called SCAP that believes everything that an article, a scientific article says, and I just wonder, how can they get away with it? Yeah, it's quite extraordinary that they are able uh, to get away with it. It's a thing that probably crept up on us by accident. People didn't realize that they got away with it. Industry trials through to the 1980s were often run in universities and the people in the universities had the data. As they got bigger and bigger trials, and the trials got bigger and bigger, not because the drugs got better and better, but if a drug is weaker and weaker, you need a bigger and bigger trial to show it does anything at all. And so as they got bigger and bigger, the trials became multinational, and industry said, well, it's the convenient place to keep the data is in our vaults. So that's what happened. That happened from the 1980s. I think people didn't realize what was happening. Uh, but one of the key things here is this. And when you get involved in a trial, if any of you get involved in any clinical trial, you're asked to sign an informed consent form. You're told about the risks that there could be from this new drug that you were put on. And during the 1950s and 1960s, our parents got involved in the first trials, and this is what helped liberate all of us from a lot of illnesses that used to kill us prematurely beforehand. They took these risks on behalf of the communities from which they came. They took these risks because they knew and expected that the data that came out of the risks that they took, if the drug killed them, at least <coughs> experts were there who could see what had happened and could make a judgment about what the right thing to do was. People, when they get involved in trials now, still expect that's what's happening, that the data is going to be made available to experts, and ultimately, even if they are injured, that our relatives and our friends are going to be helped. What you're not told, what you're not asked to consent to, what you're not informed about or asked to consent to is that your data is going to be hidden. If you are asked that, and we can insist on that happening, if you're asked that, most people who are recruited to clinical trials will probably say no. Now, it may be too late to ask questions like that, because industry have moved their trials out of Europe to India and China and elsewhere, where sometimes the patients who are recruited to these trials don't exist. <coughs> and if patients don't exist, they can't die on the drug or have other awful injuries. Good evening. I got your point. I heard very good what you said. And I, I must say I rather liked your book, The Antidepressant Era, for instance. But aren't you risking a bit to be a bit one-sided? I mean, in the real world, I think you're a doctor. You must agree hypertension exists. But not, not everybody has to, to take anti-hypertensive anti drugs. I think real depression exists, but I agree, not everybody has to take medications. So I wonder, you're a psychiatrist, what do you give, what do you offer your patient with a severe depression, but I think it exists. 
I am aware of psychotherapy. Do you really believe psychotherapy alone will treat, will help at least? Treat is perhaps a bit too much, but will help all patients with psychiatric diseases. If you got an infarction, don't you ask for TPA? Or you just die? What do you do? Um, <clears throat> the anti-psychotic group of drugs used for schizophrenia is a terribly small market. The antidepressant group of drugs used for melancholia is a terribly small market. The market of drugs for heart attacks is a terribly small market. The industry makes money out of antipsychotics and anticonvulsants given for bipolar disorder, SSRIs given for nervous conditions in primary care that don't need these treatments to be given to them. The cardiac money is in the statin group of drugs to lower cholesterol levels. And the clinical trials we have is that unless people have had a prior heart attack, and most people put in a statin these days haven't had a prior heart attack, that actually these drugs <coughs> increase mortality, not reduce mortality. I am arguing for the kind of medicine that I think you're arguing for also. That's the medicine that is being lost. It's not just manic depressive illness that's been lost, it's the medicine that you and I were trained in that is being lost. It's being, repla <coughs> it's being replaced by healthcare incorporated, where if you try to practice the kind of medicine you've just outlined, you are at risk of losing your job. What I do, if for people who are severely depressed, I will give them an antidepressant, not an SSRI because they're not particularly good. I will give them ECT if need be. And I am not against therapy. As I argued earlier, you shouldn't hear this talk as an argument against drug treatments. I do not give psychotherapy rather than drugs. But the question is, as Pinnell said, it's great if we have the kinds of cases where the treatment will work, but it's also extraordinarily important to know when not to give a treatment. Does that answer your question? Sorry. The New England Journal of Medicine, you, you know what it is, uh, talks about, talked uh, some, some months ago about our our responsibility, responsibility of all of us to not use the words consume medicine, the patient as a consumer of drugs or whatever. Just, and I think that's, that, that's a good point. Uh, we are, just as your co-chairman suggested, we are all using iPads and whatever to consume technology, as we are all of us consuming medicine. And I think that's the way forward, to, to not talk about consuming medicine, uh, financial restraints and so on, but think again of the, I, I don't know the English word, but uh, the companionship of patient and doctor, and that's what we have to, to, to look for. Yes, I think I agree completely with you. But what, what we're at real risk of losing at the moment is the kind of teamwork that doctors and patients once had. Medicine used to be about when I was ill, I took my problem to the doctor who might be able to help me. Medicine has now is increasingly becoming. I am being made ill by doctors giving me, asking me to blow into a peak flow meter, are testing my cholesterol levels, are scanning my bones and giving me illnesses that I didn't know I had, giving me problems that I didn't know I had. Medicine is giving us problems these days. It's not liberating us from problems. Now, the question is, how do we get back to the kind of medicine that I think you outlined 
very well there, but we are at real risk of losing. Is it not a bit uh, one-sided to blame the medicine? I mean, uh, for example, uh, the total body scans, uh, they are uh, forbidden by law. The people go uh, by mass to uh, uh, Germany because they, they want to do a uh, total body scan because there's like a kind of fear and maybe people are suffering from fear and are rather trying to find solutions in uh, a medical way. And of course, they go to a medical doctor for that. But even if, if there is a law for, to forbid that, they, they try to find a way to do it. I mean, maybe there's something wrong between brackets. That's not so easily to point at, like general fear or something. One of the best examples of this, I think, I mean, you're both, I mean, this point that you raised, and it's a point that's been raised up here, and it's a point that you raised as well. Bipolar disorder plays on the fear that parents have for their children. Industry don't create, if you're a mother who has a child, industry haven't created your love for and fear for uh, the <coughs> child but they exploit it wonderfully well. And one of the places, one of the curious <coughs> paradoxes, uh, one of the areas that's most clear in is this. We put the system we have in place at the moment in place in 1962 because, because a pill called thalidomide caused birth defects. We thought that we could control the problem with controlled trials. If you show the drug works, then this is a way forward to make drugs safer. But in fact, as of 1962, there had only been one drug that had been through a placebo-controlled trial before it was about to come onto the market. And that drug was thalidomide. The system we put in place to make drugs safer for all of us was one that the drug that caused the problems, that caused us to act, was one that came completely safely through it. And no one has stopped to think, well, did we do the right things? What, and this comes through right now to the present day, you're talking about you know, the marketing and we will go to Germany for total body scans and things like that. Well, you know, we won't, really. Let me give you pregnancy again and take you back to the problem that began the whole thing of women being pregnant and having children born with birth defects. Women today don't smoke when they get pregnant. They don't drink alcohol. If you go to a party and you're pregnant and you're drinking wine, people at the party will whip the wine out of your hand. They don't eat soft cheeses. They don't eat uncooked meats. They don't even have a hot shower. They'll turn the heat in the shower down. They maybe won't even drink tea and coffee. Ten years ago, they wouldn't have had an anti present. But 15 years, well, 10 years later, 15% of pregnant women are taking antidepressants. Why? Because their doctors say to them that if you don't treat the depression or nerves you have, that this will cause your child to have a birth defect. Your doctor or Medical articles, journal articles give you the impression that if you don't have a total body scan, things are going to go very badly wrong. It's, we've created this curious market where you get scared into having these pills because you're, you, you pass the natural caution you've got about smoking, 
and alcohol and soft cheeses is completely suspended in this market. You think your doctor is looking after you, but in fact, he's not. He's in a vulnerable uh, position too. Just like you're in a vulnerable position vis-a-vis -vis your doctor, he is in a, an awfully vulnerable position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the pharmaceutical companies. And that's, I think, the, that's the nature of the problem we've got. It's, yes, we're concerned to do the best things, but the problem is you don't know the data. You're not being let get access to the data. Your doctors not let get access, get, get, get access to the data. Your doctor was once skeptical about giving you pills when you were pregnant. He's not skeptical anymore. And he's the one who's going to persuade you that you should have these things. Thank you for your quite disturbing lecture. Uh, if you think long, uh, long enough about it, you might wake up in the morning having a depression in itself. But I do miss one point a bit. Um, I'm sure marketing does have a huge influence on um, well, medicine being used, but you would expect that the scientific research, or, or at least um, setting a diagnose, should have evolved as well in a sense that we know better what illness someone has. I do miss that a bit in this lecture. So where would you set the improved diagnostics on, on a variety of illnesses in this story? Um, I don't know that diagnostics have improved. Um, we still have severe uh, uh, depressive <coughs> disorders like melancholia. You can make a uh, diagnosis still. We can still make a manic depressive diagnosis. It may be called bipolar 1 disorder these days. But in fact, <coughs> Um, and, and if we did make these diagnoses and restricted the use of uh, the medications to these more severe conditions, um, that might not be too bad. But the improved diagnostics that you talk about, for the most part, um, don't really show any substantial improvements over those. What they show is the creation of a lot more diagnoses and the diagnoses for the most part are based on measurements that don't reveal a true disease. They're measurements which show areas of bone thinning that's made into an illness called osteoporosis. There are measurements of, um, of let me give you a good example of a Perhaps, let me stop what I was saying and give you a good example that will maybe um, <coughs> live in your mind a little bit longer. Impotence huh. is a real illness. When things don't work for a man, this is a very serious condition. And if we can treat it, we can restore great joy to a man's life. We can help them a lot. But the marketing of drugs like Viagra and Cialis and related drugs has all been about persuading 21 and 22 year old young boys that if they're not 100% rigid the entire time that they're impotent. That if there's any variation at all from the perfect penis that they have a disease. Now that is not impotence as it once was. But the improvement, of, what I'd be concerned about is the improvement of diagnostics that you talked about has been the creation of that kind of illness. It becomes most clear, and if any of you want 
whole part of this talk, it becomes most clear, the story to explore most clearly, is the story of female sexual dysfunction. <coughs> Following Viagra, industry thought there's an even bigger market here. There's all the women who are not happy with their, with their, 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 with their, with their, with their, <coughs> ah, I got stuck in. All the women who are not happy with their, stuff. The women who are not happy with, um, getting slightly tired and tongue-tied. Women who are just not happy from uh, the sexual point of view. A range of different illnesses were created. Rating scales were uh, actually produced to help doctors make uh, the diagnosis of these new conditions like female hypoactive sexual uh, 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 desire disorder. And the hope was that a drug like Viagra or Cialis or whatever would be sh shown to work, minimally work. I mean, it didn't need to cure the problem, it just needed to show a little bit of a difference and the drug would have been able to get on the market and the industries or the companies involved would have been able to go out there and persuade all of the women who are having any problems with their, with their, with their love lives, that the problem wasn't the men in their lives, the problem was to do with their low testosterone levels or things like this. Now, that didn't happen because of a group of women who were able to derail um, uh, the, the, um, the marketing being done by the pharmaceutical companies of these drugs. There's a movie that's well worthwhile for you all um, to watch if you're able to get called, called uh, it's a movie called Orgasm Inc. It's one that I would recommend to all of you to watch. It's extremely amusing, but it also shows you what a determined group of women can do. And in terms of if there's any hope for the future, the people who have brought all of the drug crises to a head in recent years have not been doctors, they've been women, they've been mothers and and and, uh, and also wives who have taken on uh, the scientists and have said that this is wrong. Now that's a story that I try to outline in this book here, so if you want to know more about it, that's a place for you to go. Okay? It's Rest is a to thank uh, Professor Healy en uh, ook heel hartelijk bedankt voor David. Voor iedereen nog een fijne avond. De volgende keer daar.